week on Ultra Simple Golf, we're back out at the Durban Country Club and we're joined again by former Springbok captain John Smith. John, good to see you again. Good to be here, John. John, last week we dealt with a couple of basics, the alignment and one or two fundamentals on the swing and, and you know, we're dealing with some, some wind that mm. uh, is going to play a big role in how you address this golf course. So we've got you out here on the second hole. It's a very demanding par three as they all are here at Durban Country Club but it's all a lot to do with strategy here. So. What we want to do now is look a little bit about at your pre-shot routine and try and give you a good clear plan for how to attack the shot. You know, once again, there's all sorts of issues to deal with. It's well bunkered, treacherous slopes around the green. So it's a hole that you can attack, but we've got to settle on a good distance and, uh, and choose the right club and then, and then go from there. But mm. following last week's uh, episode, do you feel like you're a little bit more comfortable in what you're trying to do in your swing? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the comfort is now actually being comfortable with being uncomfortable, really. Yeah, it's yeah. just setting up and aligning and making sure that, you know, when I, when I put my, my blade to the ball yeah. and then I set up my stance and I look up, I feel yeah. like I'm always going left, but it actually has, it's straightened up and it actually has helped. So, and that, as long as I align that to turning early and not pulling my body yeah. back, then things go well for me. Yeah. But when I get head back to those bad habits, sure. it, all, it all goes right again. No, well, it, it's important now at this stage while we're working on it to stay committed to what you're working on and not be too result uh, orientated. Obviously, when you're playing in tournaments and things like that, you've got to go and play. Yeah. But you know, as you're trying to make changes, commit. But let's get out on the tee now and go and uh, try and make another par okay. on the top. I like it. All right. Unbelievable. Right, John. Great nine nine. Unbelievable. 172 meters downwind. Amazing shot. But I've got to reprimand you on one thing. You hit the ball off the deck. Yeah. Now, it's an unwritten law that it's one time you're allowed to peg the ball up. You've got to understand that you get more spin than hitting it off the deck. Plus, if you hit it a fraction fat off the deck, you're going to goof it in front. Mm, yeah. Now, off a peg, it's very unlikely that you're going to hit the ball fat psychologically. Yeah. You'll get the ball itself. So always use a peg on the tee. Very, very critical. Good, got you. Now to get to the actual hole on a course management side. This was a legendary hole when I was on tour 40 years ago. I used to be terrified of it because in those days, there was bush literally from tea to green, both sides. One mistake, you were dead. Now, in today's circumstance, the wind is down. So, you've got to get the ball up in the air and let the wind, you never ever fight the wind. Use the wind as a friend. Now, in today's circumstance, your direction is not going to be critical because of the wind from straight behind, behind you. Yeah. So the margin of error is minimized by you, well, miles. Yes. But the key is that you've got to get the ball up because you can see there's a massive upslope short. If you don't get up, it's going to roll down. Exactly. That's number one. So in these circumstances, you're pretty well covered by not making a massive mistake. But if the wind is into you, now we've got a problem. The first thing most people do is obviously take a club more and start hitting harder. Now, again, it's instinctive. The minute you start hitting harder, you turn quicker and become steeper, which is now the cardinal sin in golf. Mm -hmm. The steeper you come, obviously the quicker the ball's going to get up in the air, plus what people don't understand, the spin is now vigorous. Now the more spin you've got aer aerodynamically, the ball is going to climb. Yes. So you haven't got a club in your bag to get up to the green. So what you've got to do is in this scenario, if this wind was into us, you, it's about, I would say, a two golf club wind. So instead of a five iron, you take a three iron. In your case, instead of a nine iron, well, it was a brutal shot you hit. I can't believe you hit it that far, but I would have advised you to even go to a five iron. So it's nearly a four club Same swing. With a couple of adjustments, which I'm going to tell you yes. now. Okay. The first is, when you've taken two clubs more, if it's a two club wind, grip down the shaft just a fraction. Show me. Just, there's the conventional one. Just grip down two fingers. Now, it's an amazing thing how that 
the length of, or shortening the shaft, you've still got to be positive, but again, you're closer to the ball. Okay. Okay? Now, the key here is shoulder turn. All the great players in my era, yeah. Hogan, Palmer, Nicholas, Gary Player especially, they had monster shoulder turns. Now, the further you turn your shoulders, the wider the arc, the more club head speed with no apparent. Ernie is another great exponent of that. No wrists. Now, the key here, under windy conditions, the cause of your anxiety is the ball. You don't want to get away from the cause of your anxiety. So you don't turn your shoulders and you cock your wrist very quickly. Mm. You've now committed the cardinal sin. You've become steep, you've lost what we call connection, and you start picking the club up and chopping down. Everything changes. Exactly. That's where you get that upward motion and massive spin. Yeah. So the key here, grip down, and the big thing I would suggest to you into the wind, we'll do it later, cut out the wrist cock. Don't, not completely, but it's amazing when you don't consciously cock your wrist, yeah. you become more solid. When you see Tiger at his best, you know, 10, 12 years ago, as he takes the club back, he does what we call going back wide. Now, he's working from the shoulders, not from here. Now, when you look at him and Tiger uh, and Ernie, they're very wide away from the ball and it appears to be slow and lethargic yes. and liquid. Their shoulders are turning slowly, but the club is going quite fast. Now you see guys panicking in the wind, cocking early because they don't want to get too far from the ball. Now they pick the club up, it's not quick, but they lose what we call uh, connection. Yeah. Now the analogy, very simple or simply, is if I was going to give you a club, God forbid, I'd stand here and I would just turn my shoulders with a stiff arm to there. Now which is going to hurt you more? That one, bang, or this? That one. This is going to sting you. Yeah. This is going to hurt you. It's going to move my head down. Exactly, because you're incorporating your body. So three major things into the wind. Grip down a, sh uh, a tad, yeah. two fingers. Depending on the wind, obviously more club. And the key, and the final point here, swing not long. to get swing the wide. steepness, swing wide, which means don't cock. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. If you don't cock and you turn your shoulders, you will be wide. If you don't turn your so shoulders and cock... Pretend that's a five iron and give me that wide swing. Show me what's It's exactly, thing. whether it's a wedge or a five yeah, iron, it's exactly yeah. the same. In this scenario, I've got the nine iron. Look how wide it is because mm. I'm turning my shoulders. Yeah. Now just look at the width of the club head away from my right hip. I'm now going to just cock my wrist and not turn. Look how narrow I am. Simple as that. Yeah. Now the final point, if I'm in here, look at the angle I am, I'm too steep. I've explained to you already, yes. by being steep, you come down yeah. steep, you get spin. boom, spin up, Hush. loss of yeah. distance. Yes. Here, you're now shallow, but more importantly, you've incorporated your whole body, which is your shoulders, rotating round. And I promise you, it, that's when the game becomes exciting, because there's no effort. Does that make sense? It does. Brilliant. Brilliant. Let's have a go. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Now, John, straight away we can see the improvement even from last week. Much more shoulder turn, less arm swing. Left arm down the line is, is so much more solid than it was. Yeah. But I'm really loving the, the move through the ball now. It feels easy as well. Uh, exactly. Like it doesn't feel like I'm trying to kill it. Correct. The weight shift is amazing. But where am I going to release my tension now? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get on the bike later okay. and ride to Harry's. Okay. But I mean, that's unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, that phenomenal. Does. It feels like there's far more control, far more consistency. And I sort of, sort of want to get, you almost feel like you can get to that stage where you can actually expect it to go where, you, where you're aiming. Oh, isn't that the, the, the aim, name of the game with it golf? Is, it's, uh, Fantastic. This is the idea. Excellent.
this week's Echelon, did you see that moment? We take a look back at the 2010 Ryder Cup. The match was evenly poised at 13 and a half points each when Graham McDowell came to the 16th green, all square in his match against Hunter Mahan. He really needed to pull off a great shot to give himself a chance at birdie and take the lead. It's such a crucial stage in the match. Leaving himself about 16 foot pin high left of the hole, it was an incredible shot under this kind of pressure. You could literally sense the tension building amongst the enormous crowd as well as on the face of fellow Irishman Rory McIlroy. McDowell now stands over the putt, 18 inches left of the hole, very quick downhill and with one of the better strokes on the European Tour, McDowell does it again. A beautifully weighted putt dies into the middle of the hole, giving us one of the great moments in Ryder Cup history and ultimately the point that Europe needed for a historic victory. We're down on the range working on the driver now and I want to see how it goes when you're really at full pace. We put you under a bit of pressure on the, on the first tee in, in episode one, now in, in a bit of a demanding uh, par three. So now we've got the big dog out and this is where the, where the fun lies. Yeah. And the swing doesn't really change fundamentally when you go to the longer club, but obviously the pace increases. So we want to keep focused on the balance and the rhythm, but keep paying attention to the amount of shoulder turn, to the active left side, and try not get into the habits of killing it with your right hand. It used to be my go-to, but I've been really? avoiding it like the plague lately. Okay. So uh, it's normally just been far on off the tee box. So it'd be great to be able to hit, get back into hitting a big, big driver again. But we also just need to be aware of the fact that you, you want to have fun. You don't want to come out here and be Mr. Perfect and hit everything. Uh, you want to is, 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 is different not the way. No. no, well I mean that's it, so you, that, I couldn't agree more, but when you take out the driver, let's let's give it a rip, but let's do the best we can to keep it in play. Okay. John has a very good setup. He's a little bit right with his feet at address and his shoulders left, which is not uncommon amongst very muscle-bound men. Now as he takes the club back, he has the ability to turn the shoulders into a great position, keeping the left arm straight, giving him good width at the top of the backswing. The swing is right on plane and he now is fully loaded into the right side. From here he transfers the weight beautifully into the left side, rotating his middle, giving him freedom to release the left hand. He does have a little bit of a chicken wing with the left forearm in order to keep the ball in play, but this is what all good ball players do to keep the ball down the line. A good swing by a great athlete. Jay, we're standing here on the 16th at Durban Country Club and it's a very demanding tee shot. And, and you know, with all the talk these days with the new drivers and the adjustable technology, how effective is it? Because, you know, you want to be able to come to a course like Durban Country Club and many of the other tight driving uh, courses with it that are demanding and hit the ball in the fairway. Yeah. How helpful is this technology now going forward? Don, I think it's incredibly helpful. I'll tell you why. We see it day in and day out on our retail floor. You know, we help guys on the yeah. flight scope machine and we see how the, the, the direction of the person's flight changes yeah. and how the height that the guy's hitting the golf ball. If he yeah. comes in there and he's hitting a low cut, yeah. we can literally, by adjusting the driver, get him to start hitting a high draw with the same golf swing. Yeah. So I've seen it firsthand. I think what we need to do is a guy with a repetitive golf swing like yourself needs to hit a few shots here on the 16th. Let's set them on different settings, the various drivers, yeah. and you see if the proof is not in the hitting. Perfect, let's do it. Great stuff. There you go. See how nicely that moves from left to right? Sure. Just a, a nice, it took off and then just softly falls off to the right. Set on a little bit open, so all you have to do is make your normal swing, and then from there, the ball moves left to right. Now that's Incredible. a shape that I like to hit, but yes. I, I, I've, my bad shot is I've never hit it for the right reasons. I'd get ahead and leak it right, but that yes. really felt like I could release it down the line and get let's, what I want. Let's, let's try with a square on the, on the custom and see if there's if it's a little straighter and less left to right shape. Okay. Is this a little shorter perhaps lengthwise in the club? A little bit. Okay. So what are we looking here? Just slightly straighter shape? This should come out dead straight. If you make a decent swing. Okay. Oh my. How does that feel? Wow, that's unbelievable. You see how deadly straight that went? We just set the face on square. It's 10 and a half degrees, fair enough. So for you, it's probably too much loft. Yes. But for a guy who tends to lose it to the right, yeah. either set it on square or slightly closed, you won't have to worry about that leak to the right that puts you in trouble. Jeez, that's phenomenal. Yeah. That really was so solid. Right, next one, what do we got? Finally, finally, we're going to set this. This one is set on closed. So you should get a little draw coming out of this one. Okay. It's the jet speed from TaylorMade. It's a little lighter. So for a guy with your type of swing speed, you'll probably find that the ball will move right to left. Okay. 
So for the average player who tends to lose it to the right, it's a great club to have. It gives a couple of extra miles, club at speed, gets a bit, a bit, bit more ball speed is what she gives you the distance, and you won't be losing the ball to the right. Let's see if this ball moves a little right to left now. Here we go. Little draw. It's amazing how when you set the faces on what you want the club to do, you make a half decent golf swing. How the shape of the ball is yeah. dictated by the face angle. It sounds very, very simple and very logical, but people don't believe. They say, well, you know, if you set the face, if I'm a slice, I want to remain a slice. Or if I'm a guy who hits the ball yeah. from right to left and I hit the big hook. If you set the face angle correctly, you can change dramatically how the ball flies through the air. Yeah and how much shape it has on the thing. Well, that speaks for itself there because I really do lose the ball left to right, especially yeah. now I'm a little bit tight. Sure. And that soft five to 10 foot draw, you know, it just makes you feel so good over the ball that you know that that's there. But I think the whole experience of, you know, coming to the golfers club and consulting yeah. with your guys, and it's not just about, you know, taking the spanner and tweaking it and, and yes. then taking it to the course. Get to understand it. Hit half a dozen balls, you know, with each setting to see what it produces. Isn't that very important? Don, you know, the thing is with my guys, when they're fitting you, we really do take an interest in trying to perfect your shape. So you're not, if you say to us, listen, I've got four or five holes in my golf course. Yeah, yeah we're standing on the 16th tee at Durban yeah. Country Club. It's such an iconic golf course. Yeah. And I always used to be so nervous of this hole. I Absolutely. can tell you if we had adjustable drivers in those days, oh. I would have made sure that I set it on two degrees closed yeah. just for this tee shot. I but uh, I used to find myself on that road on the right hand side and beyond the mangroves. Yeah. But I can tell you that if there's four or five holes that bother you at your golf course, we're always wasting shots. Yeah. Set your driver up to fight against your bad shot. You know, we all work for a living. We don't have time yeah. to play golf seven days a week and practice and fix yeah. our swings. So if you can buy a golf club that's going to make all the difference in terms of your shot shape, and you know you've got a shocking slice or a terrible hook, if you've got a golf club that you can pay a two or three or four thousand rand for that can fix those terrible shots, why not spend the money? Hit more fairways. And we've seen what, you know, how bad Tiger's driving has become, yeah. and it's affecting his scoring. If he could hit fairways, he'd be winning again. Totally. Rory with the British Open hit lots and lots of fairways at optimum length. That's and that made all the difference, great. because he was hitting seven irons and eight irons, and other guys were hitting hybrids in. Makes a big difference. But to stand over the ball with that self-confidence and belief and an understanding of what you need to do. I mean, I'm far from consistent right now. Yeah. But I mean, I've hit shots there that really, you know, produced a result that I needed on a very, very difficult hole. We set the, the, the Nike VRS Covert 2.0, which is Rory's driver. We set it up for a fade. You had a beautiful little five-yard cut there. Yeah. And then we went on the custom, which was set squared, went deadly straight. Yeah. And the jet speed we set on a little draw and you turn it over five or ten feet in the air. So you can see it definitely does work. Brilliant, Jay. Thanks very much. Thanks, Don. John, we had a great time being out there for a couple of holes with you and, and working on the game. I hope it's made a bit of sense to you and, and given you a bit of uh, yeah, clarity absolutely. on what you yeah. need to do. It's been a while since, uh, well, it's been 10 years since I last took direction. And uh, um, I suppose you don't spend time on the game enough of it and then you just get into these bad habits and you don't get an idea of how to rectify it. So yeah. today was, you know, it was quite an eye-opener. Just being on the series has been an eye-opener. And you, you and your father make it sound so simple. And at the end of the day, it is. It's supposed to be simple. Yeah. So uh, alignment, you know, don't try and kill every single ball, which is a habit sure. of mine. And I sort of come at you and I want to beat the death out of every yeah. little white ball. So uh, there are a couple of simple things that hopefully I can take out of this. And, and and you know, it might not, might not make me a scratch golfer, but at least I'll be a little bit more competitive and, and keep the ball in play a little bit more often. Well, I think the most important thing is to find a way to get the enjoyment back. I think yeah. that's the challenge that every golf pro has out there. And almost the responsibility is to get people playing the game again. You know, you've become a really keen cyclist and doing great with that. But we're actually losing a lot of golfers to cycling because I think of the difficulty factor and the stress that comes with the game. Yeah. So when you can find something simple that helps you improve, you'll want to come back and play. But we spoke about it earlier. And it's, yeah. it's one of the greatest sports, especially for your kids to play. Yeah. They don't need any opposition. They can come out here. It's safe. Yeah. It keeps them out of mischief. It, uh, and it teaches you a lot about life as well. You know, there's a lot of self-discipline involved and yeah. it certainly helps you temper your, yeah. your, your, your tantrums every now and again when a ball goes uh, wayward. So there's a lot to be learned out of the game and it has a lot to offer, especially for young kids. We talked about the fact that you know, throughout your career, when you were at your best, you really found that you were doing the basics extremely well, which obviously applies to, to golf. Now, you know, talk a little bit about you know, the, the demands of your particular position and the role it's, you played in the bottom it's, uh, 
Yeah, I think rugby is certainly a combat sport. It's yeah. warfare really and it's very physical, but you know, one of the most important jobs that I had well, obviously as a hooker was to throw the ball, sure. which is quite a, a finite job. You know, it's quite a, a detailed uh, uh, maneuver, I yeah. suppose, and yeah. it took a lot of training and I had to move from prop to hooker. So yeah. a lot of it is getting detail. used Dr. Cheryl Calder yeah. who uh, helped me on, on actually the thing that you've helped me with, alignment. Yeah. And alignment for me was really just getting elbows in, getting, you know, making sure that I worked in a straight line where I started. So my backswing, yes. instead of starting it and bringing it out, eliminating yeah. the room for error, starting the ball back, keeping my elbows in and then knowing when to release and staying within right. the same line and it's almost the same stuff that you guys yes. are trying to teach me here and I, I knew when I started getting a ball that drifted towards a long ball at the back because sometimes a ball would drift to the right yes. come back on a Monday I realign, focus on my elbows being in, focus on where my ball, the ball flight started and try and understand when I let go of the ball because the, the timing of letting go of the ball would depend on how the spin yeah. would affect the, the ball at the end of its flight at the, at the back of the line out. So um, I suppose I can always relate back to my yeah. throwing in when I'm playing golf in the future. Absolutely, but did you feel that when you were doing it at your best there was a feel, there was a softness and a flow to it? You, uh, did you feel the pressure where you, just, you were squeezing you know, the ball the a little tighter? To get into a rhythm of how you throw the ball and to get it to the flight going, yeah. it takes practice and hours sure. and hours of that. Then you've got to get over the, over the obstacle of being unafraid of yeah. the opposition and being unafraid of where you think your guys call the ball. So okay. just throwing a ball and all you see is your guy and all you know is where to put that ball. And uh, once you get in it, you get into a rhythm and you've done it for so many times. Yeah. I could close my eyes and throw the ball to Victor. If I just knew what the call was, it was sure. one of those things that just became such a, a natural sort yeah. of muscle memory type of thing where you get that feel. Yeah. And um, and if, it, if you ever had a, a wayward day, it was such an easy thing to, to fix on a Monday yeah. because you could actually remember how yeah. uncomfortable you felt on the Saturday. So we know your work ethic was amazing and you know your professional outlook and approach to the game but you know under those pressure situations when you had to pull all these talented individuals and different personalities together and get the guys focused what kept you calm how did you go about it um, uh, I suppose at the end of the day I always had a I always like to have quite a stern belief in, in, in whatever I was doing in the group within uh, that I worked within, what we were doing, what our outlook was. Um, and when there's a belief in what your goal is and, and the people around you, and yeah. I did, I believed heavily in the people around me. We had an unbelievable team, and we still do. We have unbelievable players. But that group of players that surrounded me for so many years, um, yeah, they were they were people that I could rely on. You know, right. Victor, you know, Jean de Villiers, Skulkberger, Juan Smith. Uh, Fareed Priya, the list just goes on and on. Percy Montgomery, Osterrand, all these legends of the game that I've played with. And, uh, you know, it's, it was always heartening to have, you know, those guys in your corner. So when the chips were down, you know, we'd all been through a similar pathway. We'd had some really tough times in 2006, and I suppose we had reference. You know, sure. We had reference of tough times, and those references and how you got through them yeah. always helped us when it came down to the crunch. You know, when you look back on your career, you came up against so many incredible players in the opposition. Just single out one that really you know, got your blood boiling and wanted you to play and brought up the best. <laughs> well, I think the one that I, I certainly revered, and it's quite topical, you know, he retired from the game at the absolute pinnacle, winning the Heineken Cup and the top 14 for Toulon. But Johnny Wilkinson was really? someone, I think, that transformed the game of rugby union. If you think about where the game came from 95, in 95 we had John Lomu who just yeah. hit the scene and ran over people around sure. them. He just was incredible and he just boosted the game the, uh, so much and I think the, 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 the scope of who watched the game yeah. because people came out to look at Jonah and then we had this Johnny Wilkinson guy who was you know so unlike the usual sportsmen who were normally quite flamboyant and looking for this yeah. limelight this guy was just all about work yeah. all about work ethic and about performance and uh, you know putting through a, a, a drop kick with his wrong foot to win a World Cup set him up we thought that would be the pinnacle and he just carried on and yeah. on and on and, and uh, so I think he was certainly one of the guys that I was privileged enough to play against you know, really, it's been a pleasure being with you. It feels like we've kind of bookended your, your career back yeah, from 2004 to now. Have, yeah. But it, it really was a, a, a pleasure and a privilege watching you play and everything you did for the game. Is, you know, I think a lot of the guys now are still reaping the rewards of some of the, of the culture that you put there. So, John, congratulations on an amazing career. And I, I hope we Thank get to you. see you out on the course a little bit more well, often. Well, we're in the same town now. So uh, maybe, yeah. these, uh, maybe you can see your lessons in actual practice uh, in one I of these so. rounds in the near future. Super. John, thanks, thanks John. very much. Appreciate it. Excellent. Go well.